This podcast is sponsored by valleygivesback.org. What will you be remembered for? Name a Valley nonprofit in your estate plan and create a legacy that tells future generations what matter to you. Making a gift that costs nothing during your lifetime is easy and revocable if things change. With a planned gift, you have the power to impact the Valley forever without affecting your current lifestyle. Your action inspires others to make a difference in their own way. Remember the Valley. Ask your accountant, financial planner, or attorney about planned giving options. Plan now. Give later. Impact tomorrow. Learn more at valleygivesback.org. Yeah, why not? I mean, you know, it'd make more sense for you to do it. All right, here we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Valley Sports Rewind. My name is not Mike Kenichi. No, I'm Eugene Driscoll of valleyindy.org. And Mike and I thought we would do something a little different for this episode. I'm going to try to talk to Mike. Mike's going to try to converse with me. It's going to be a Mike and Eugene podcast. Mike, the host of this podcast, welcome to your own podcast. Thank you, Eugene. I appreciate it. Thank you uh, for taking the time out to do it. Same here. I want to say Mike a few more times. I don't think I said that. Uh, sh- can I call? It, should I call you Mike or Nietzsche? Um, you know, it, you can call me whatever you want. I mean, you know, I, I in a you know professional s- s- setting, I'd rather be called Mike. But if you feel comfortable calling me Nietzsche, you could do that. It's up to you. Well, now I'm nervous. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought yeah. we would talk about. Uh, Hometown Heroes, the Channel 10 Comcast show you host. Uh, is it weekly or bi-weekly or how many times is it on? Yeah, wait, wait. This is Eugene. I'm interrupting uh, myself and Mike. I forgot to, as we were taping this, to point out that Hometown Heroes is a sports show, essentially, that Mike hosts uh, with production by Sean Morse. And on that show, he brings in, usually, although it it changes from time to time. Uh, Valley sports legends, much, lo- much like this podcast. But he elaborates that. But I don't, we don't get to it till like twenty minutes later. So I'm just throwing that in there. It's on uh, once a month. Um, it's on the first Tuesday of the month. Oh, gotcha. So, okay. Of each month, yeah. First Tuesday of each month. Yeah. And uh, but before we get to that, I wanted to talk to you for a moment. There was big news for well sad news not 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 really big news i'm mischaracterizing it but there was sad news this week for anybody of the generation x era with the passing of luke perry from 90210 right. what was this show? I'm, I'm so stupid see i didn't watch 90210 but even i was struck and saddened that this guy who was you know from our generation passed away uh, i think he was just 52 years old right and then i saw on your facebook page you have like an like you have an encyclopedic knowledge of valley sports you also have a quite scary knowledge of every episode of 90210 so talk to me though how what was it like uh as someone around my age to learn of the passing of luke perry you know eugene i mean um I grew up on that show. You know, that show came out, and I remember it like it was yesterday. It came out when I was in eighth grade. And the reason I watched it was totally by accident. What happened was um, I was a fan of the show The Simpsons, and they had moved to Thursday nights. They were going to try to compete with the Cosby show. So The Simpsons had moved to Thursday nights, and they just happened to advertise that show. And, you know, I... I saw that it, it kind of revolved around high school kids, and I just thought, you know, I'll try it. And I got into it right from the first episode. And, uh, you know, Luke Perry was a tremendous part of that show. You know, Eugene, he kind of, in a lot of ways, you know, all the actors and actresses that were on that show, they had big parts. But his his character was always, I would always say, was probably the heart and soul of that show because he his character was like a dark character. He had went through a lot of like tough times in his life. So a lot of his episodes 
were really more, you know, he he didn't his character never had a great life. And so, you know, he did such a tremendous job playing that character. And I guess he's he kind of went on to a very respectable uh, after 90210 career. And this has nothing to do with Valley Sports Rewind, but uh, whatever. Uh, I noticed him on that show, Oz. I don't know. Did you ever watch that HBO show, Oz? Oh, yeah, from- yeah, yeah. I And, you know, I had seen his later work. You know, when you watch a show that you're into and you get attached to characters, when you see them in other things, you watch for that reason, just to see that that actor and see, you know, how they're doing and stuff like that. You know, I mean, any type of show you watch, if you're big into that show and you and the character, you know, especially the actor, you want to go see them and the other things. And he, he really did do well. A lot of times, you know, you get uh, type typocast, you know, or whatever they call that. Typecast, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And you and end you up in a bunch be, of Sharknado movies. Yeah, you know, like, I mean, think about this, Eugene. I mean, Henry Winkler, who was just phenomenal playing that part of, you know, Arthur Fonzarelli in Happy Days, but he never really, like, he, he did he did good as a writer and a director afterwards, but he never really had another big part as far as acting went. Up that, until the last acting. couple of years. He did, yeah, he's on he, uh He's on that show Barry on HBO. He's pretty good. He's he's essentially playing himself. Right. He was also really good on uh, Arrested Development, but that was sort of a, a cult show. Now has gone mainstream because it's been revived on Netflix. But little known Henry Winkler movie, and I actually saw it in a theater in 1982, which is highly inappropriate because there's lots of nudity. Night Shift, the movie Night Shift. Oh yeah, Shift that was a great. Yeah, that was a great movie with Michael yeah. Keaton. You kids like music? Da, 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 da. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, and he was phenomenal in that. But you know, I think Happy Days went off the year in 1984, and I kid you not, I never saw him act in anything again he until that disappeared, movie. Yeah. yeah, the movie The Water Boy came out, and he was good friends with Adam Sandler, and he was in that movie. That's the first time I had seen him in anything when that show left, but. Luke Perry really, you know, kept his career going. And out of all the people on 90210, I mean, some of them, did, you know, Shannon Doherty has done good at times, you know, Jenny Garth, but most of them, they really didn't do much after 90210, but he did. He kept going, and, you know, that's a credit to him. But you know what's ironic, Eugene? You always hear for years, like, people will always say, you know, you got to watch what you eat. You got to make sure, you know, you stay healthy. If you get too overweight, you're a candidate for a heart attack or a stroke. This guy was skinnier than anybody I've ever seen in my life, and he had a stroke. So it just goes to show you that nothing's guaranteed. You could be as healthy as can be, and nothing is really guaranteed in life. Yeah, it was definitely a sobering thing, and I think it made everybody around our age think like, oh, man, what a bummer. We're all getting old. Uh, and I've been like reading, uh, like I have like neck problems. My neck hurts all the time. So I'm I'm constantly like adjusting and cracking my neck. I've never been to a chiropractor. And today I was like looking up stuff on YouTube and they're like, well, that can, there, there, there's talk. There was a Washington Post article from like 2011, whether cracking your neck can cause a stroke. And it just totally freaked me out. But it was all based on, uh, you know, reading about. Yeah. Luke I mean, Perry it, it does make you think. Yeah. It does make you think. And I'll be honest with you, Eugene. I mean, when I heard he had the stroke, you couldn't get like a good you know, idea of how serious the stroke was. But what concerned me, and I'm not going to lie, I was reading, like, you know, you could just go to Google and type his name. So I think on Saturday, I typed his name. And what really got me nervous was when there was the rumor going around that they put him in a coma because he wasn't doing well and they were hoping that might help, Hmm. you know, get. And when I heard that, I really got nervous that, you know, this could be something bad. And then To find that news out on Monday was just, it was devastating. I read this, uh, I don't know where I saw it, so I can't really properly attribute it, but it was Tom Hanks' son. I guess his name, Colin, or whatever his name. Yeah, he was actually in a couple movies in the early 2000s. You know, I I, I think one I remember was Orange County. He was in. Yeah, and he he was in. uh, in He was in uh, 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 the TV version of Fargo, which was outstanding. But anyway, he has this story that he told on Twitter about being on a plane and this kid was crying. There was like two babies or two toddlers or however old they were just crying for like a long flight. 
And uh, it was at the point where like everybody on the plane was losing it. And uh, suddenly some dude comes in the back where the kids are and gets down as if he's greeting a king, gets on, on his knee, puts his head down and gives the child the balloon, gives both children uh, balloons. And yeah. then, uh, it turned out it was Luke Perry. I guess Luke Perry had a thing where he traveled so much he would carry balloons with him, and whenever there was a crying child on a plane, oh, he would wow. go and uh, yeah. help them out. And, they, and they, I guess so. I guess he was like a generally decent dude. And I believe. Wait, yeah. Oh wait, I, I'm leaving out as a, as a Howard Stern fan, a, as a degenerate that I am. He is famous in Howard Stern land because he stood next to Howard uh, at the MTV MTV Music Awards or Movie Awards or whatever it was when Stern dressed up as Fart Man, which I'm sure you want to hear more about but anyway well, yeah, that was Luke you Perry. Know, you talked about him being a nice guy I actually was very fortunate to meet him by accident one time oh no kid were well, you holding out on us Mike yeah well you know what I mean it's more about like you know him the person but I think it was 2001 or 2002 there was a place in Fairfield called the sea grape I don't know if it's still around anymore but it was very popular in the late 90s early 2000s and what was it like he a bar been, or what was it like? It was a club. Okay. It was a club. And I don't know, I forget what he was doing, but he, he had like some type of film he was researching in Connecticut or doing something. But I was in the bathroom and he was standing right near me and I kept looking at him like I knew him, <laughs> but I couldn't figure out who he was. And then I'm, I'm like, God, that guy looks really familiar. Who is he? And then it dawned on me who it was and... I remember like I was with one of my friends and I was like, I'm nervous to go up to this guy. So my friend's like, just go up to him and ask him. And I go, well, this is, wait, 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 was this out of, did you wait till you got out of the men's room? You did all this? Or yeah. This? Yeah. All I right. didn't do it. In the Important men's room. point. No. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. But I just said, excuse me. You know, I don't mean to uh, bother you. And I was nervous. Like I, I kid you not. I was shaking because yeah. this is a guy, you know, I grew up watching and I just happened to ask him if he was Luke Perry and he told some joke like, you know, no, I'm not that jerk. I'm not that, uh, you know, you think I look short like him. And then <laughs> he just like, he kind of like gave me a little nudge. He goes, no, I'm just kidding with you. He goes, I actually am Luke Perry. Nice to meet you. And like, literally we talked to him for like probably 10, 15 minutes. And I mean, we asked him about the show and you would think he wouldn't want to be bothered, but it was the total opposite. He would tell us, you know some funny stories on the show that happened and stuff, you know, that was really cool. And, you know, I told him, you know, he, I had told him how I didn't like how his character ended up with this one character. I wanted him to be with the other character. And he said to this day, people would still come up to him and say, you know, you should have chose Brenda. So he was really good about like, you know, but just a nice guy, you know? I mean, he was really polite, you know, because you never know if they want fans bothering them when they're on their own time. Yeah, you right, know? right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's just, an awesome story. Yeah, and I mean, like, I couldn't get over two. You know, I you see him on TV. You can't really tell if they're short or not, but, you know, I was a few inches taller than him, and that blew me away, too, because I didn't realize he was as short as he was. I think he was only, like, 5'8 or 5'9", and... That kind of threw me off because I thought he was taller than that. But yeah, in your mind's I eye, mean, yeah, they're they're like giants yeah, from seeing but him he on was, the screen. He was really a nice guy, you know. And I mean, it's funny. I've really only met like maybe a couple of celebrities in my whole life. And the funny thing is, I met him once, and I met the guy who played Eddie Haskell. What's his name? Ken Osmond. And those are the two guys from I met. And, Leave it to Beaver. And, yes. Okay. All Osmond, right. Osmond was at the Milford Mall one time doing something. And, he, you know, he was signed and stuff, so I didn't know he was going to be there, but I saw a sign that said Ken Osmond, so I, I said, I got to meet this guy. And, I mean, again, he was he was a hysterical guy, but those are the two celebrities I've met in my life, if you could believe that. That's awesome. So, but yeah. hey, what was his name on, uh, on 90210? Dylan? Dylan? Dylan McKay, yeah. And, you know, like I said, he... Um, he was at the heart of that show? In a lot of ways, because his character, the backstory on his character was he was from a, you know, he had a rich father, but his father was also, you know, an embezzler. He was kind of like a crook, and he had a mother who walked out on him when he was six years old. But, you know, truth be told, she walked out on him because she just didn't, the father, like, didn't want her around. He didn't want her in his life, and he gave her a ton of money to leave his life, but she never 
spent a dime of the money, and then when she came back into his life, she left him all the money that the father, you know, gave her, and it was millions and millions of dollars, but he never really had, like, the parents growing up that he wanted, and he had always, you know, craved that, and he had kind of made peace with his father, and then his father got blown up in a car, you know, somebody <laughs> set a bomb in his car. I don't so oh, I'm man. Not even, yeah. And, you know, years later it was discovered that his father didn't die, which I thought was a bad part by them. It made for a good storyline and the character's career, and then they just, you know, made the father be alive when all was said and done. And the ironic thing was, and I'll try to go fast because I don't want to, like, spend all a lot of time on We're this. doing a deep dive into 90210 Dylan yeah. uh, history but, here. Um, he was determined to find his father's killer, and when he found out who the, was responsible, he had found out that the the guy responsible for his father's murder had a you know a child that was attending you know the university, uh, California University, and he went there and he thought it was going to be a boy, but it ended up being a girl. Her name was Tony Marchette, and the the guy's name was Anthony Marchette. When he heard Tony Marchette, he assumed it was a boy, but it was really a girl, and he, at first, was, you know, talked to the girl because he was trying to find out info on her father. But he ended up falling in love with her. And long story short, one day we'll talk about it more. But the father couldn't accept that they wanted to be married. And he tried to put a hit out on Dylan. Yeah. Yeah. And she ended up going over to the house with Dylan's car. And she's the one who got shot and got killed. Well, oh, oh, man. What yeah. a bummer. It, it's, yeah, it almost so, sounded it almost sounded like the worst episodes of The Sopranos ever right there for a second. Yeah, there, right? Like James I mean, Gandolfini was, was going to show up. Yeah, but that was his character. His character always kind of had like that sad ending. He never really had that happy ending. You know, he had money, but that's all he had. Like he always had heartbreak. He lost his father. He lost his wife. I mean, he kind of played that dark character. And he was very misunderstood. A lot of people thought, you know, at first he was always, like, stereotyped, like he was this bad, you know, rich kid. But he really wasn't. He was just a kid who was very angry that, you know, he didn't get love from his parents. So, I mean, Luke Perry played him tremendously. And, you know, it really hits home because that's what you grew up watching. So when somebody dies like this that you kind of watched in your living room or your bedroom for years it really does kind of break your heart rest in peace luke perry mm -hmm. all right let's take a quick break break as i butcher yep. that word and we'll we'll hear from valleygivesback.org this podcast is sponsored by valleygivesback.org what will you be remembered for Name a Valley nonprofit in your estate plan and create a legacy that tells future generations what matter to you. Making a gift that costs nothing during your lifetime is easy and revocable if things change. With a planned gift, you have the power to impact the Valley forever without affecting your current lifestyle. Your action inspires others to make a difference in their own way. Remember the Valley. Ask your accountant, financial planner, or attorney about planned giving options. Plan now. Give later. Impact tomorrow. Learn more at valleygivesback.org. All right, Mike, now we're back. Okay. Hometown heroes. We were just we just had a long discussion about Luke Perry and uh, his character on 90210. You had said that he was the heart of 90210. You, sir, are the heart of hometown heroes, which <laughs> can be seen once a month, Channel 10 comcast cable television the schedule of which i put on the valley indie every week there was a long time i wasn't doing that i just keep i kept forgetting but uh you can pretty much see it there uh, every friday or uh, or saturday but so mike how long has the show been going um this may will be four years that we've done the show we started in may of 2015 and come may of this year it'll be the four-year anniversary, and which who, is who's hard we? to believe. Who's we? Oh, well, Sean Morse films my shows, and he also helps me edit the shows. And, you know, even though he doesn't interview anybody, 
he plays a big part in making sure everything's done right. So, you know, for me to say my show would just be wrong because it's really a team and, you and he's Sean. done a great, yeah, he's done a great job of helping me. You know, you had, we're recording this via Facebook Messenger and uh, we had messaged each other saying, if we, oh, you guys are ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? And uh, at the time I was actually watching Sean Morse in a Creamery Station tour announcement video. He's in front of a green screen. It's awesome. Go check oh, yeah, it out, yeah. uh, Creamery Station. Uh, you got Sean uh, up there doing his thing because he's way into music and, and filming. Uh, oh, yeah, that yeah. Good he's stuff. been doing that for probably 10 years now, yeah. So, uh, and I'm sorry if this is like really roundabout, but I'm, I'm pumping you for information myself because I've thought like now, the, you know, the Valley Indy is down to one person. Uh, it's just me. And uh, I've been thinking like, oh, I, I can't really cover, I can't sit in, in every town hall meeting uh, in Ansonia and Derby, I just physically don't have the uh, the the time. Did I say physically? I meant spiritually. I don't. I don't have the time. I just. I just can't do it. But anyway, I thought about. Right. Oh, what what if the Valley Indy did like a once a week or once a month uh, talk show? Like if we took navel gazing and put it on Comcast television. So uh, how difficult was it? to get set up uh, with your own show? Did you need any type of uh, expertise or background in it? How'd you, how did that come about four years ago? Well, you know, you know what happened was um, I had started going down there because they had had the old cable 10 football games that they used to always air every Sunday for years and years, probably 30 years. And the lady, Liz Kennard, who uh, works at Comcast, she had always wanted to convert those games to DVD. So me and Sean went down, went down there one day, and she she gave us like two games just to try and see if it would work. And we were able to do it, you know. And that's Sean. That's a credit to Sean because I'm not really good with technology. So I mean, he made that happen. But we, uh, you know, started recording games to DVD for like a good two or three months, and then a lady that had worked there and she teaches classes there, uh, Melissa Leonard, she had said to me and Sean, why don't you guys take the class? If you take the class, you can use the studio anytime you want and you could even do a show if you want to do a show. Why don't you do it? It's a six-week class. So we took the class for six weeks. We got, you know, quote-unquote certified or whatever. And I was... I was unsure if I was going to do anything with it. Well, let me just ask you, like the six-week uh, class that you take, what are the types of things you're – you don't have to be exhaustive, but just in general, hit some of the highlights. What did you learn? Oh, I, I learned how to use all the equipment in the studio, like, you know, how to record, how to put it, you know, like level thirds and stuff like that, you know, when you're putting somebody's name on the screen when they're talking and stuff like that. Oh, gotcha, um, okay. You know – when two people are having an interview, how to like change it from, you know, the other person who's talking and, you know, have it on them and then kind of have it on both of them. You learned all the like, you know, rules of the game as gotcha. far as, you know, production went. All right, cool. And, yeah. Sorry to yeah, interrupt. And it was, and it was, no, no problem. And it was really good. I, I learned a lot and I actually did record a show for someone that was in the class with us. She had, uh, Wanted to do her own talk show, and she didn't have anybody for the first episode, so she had asked me, and, you know, Melissa was really good about it because she sat in the studio with me just in case, you know, I did anything wrong. But as I was recording that show, and, you know, in my head, I'm like, you know, why don't I try to do, like, some type of show that has something to do with, you know, sports orientated or something like that. And I was kind of like throwing ideas in my head while she was talking. And then I just decided I, my big thing was how would I come up with a name? How would I do it? This and that. And then I just said, you know what, maybe I could, uh, call it like, I think legends. And I didn't like that name. So, you know, my good friend, uh, um, Lisa Jimenez, she, very smart girl, went to Fairfield U, and I figured if anybody could come up with a name, she could. So I said, give me a name that'll fit the idea of what I want to do. And, like, the second, she gave me, like, a list of show names for the show, but the second one was Hometown Heroes, and it just stuck with me. I said, yeah, that one looks like it could work. 
And, you know, then I, the big thing was getting somebody to record the show. So I talked to Sean and he said, absolutely, I'll definitely do it. I, I would like to do it. I think it'll be a lot of fun. So now it was just a matter of uh, figuring out how I want the show to be, how I want to, like, do it. Do I want to do it a half hour? Do I want to do it an hour? Do I want to do one part, two part? And we should and probably once, say, like, 25 minutes into this, I realize we haven't said that this is a show where you interview uh, past athletes uh, from right, Lower Naugatuck you know Valley. Right, but you know what else? It's not even just Lower Naugatuck Valley, and it's not even just sports. If you've impacted your town in some way, I try to have you on the show. You know, like, um, I had a young woman on a couple of years ago. She was doing a lot of great things as a guidance counselor in Orange, Connecticut. She had gotten her master's and stuff like that. And I felt like, you know, we should like try to talk to her. My goal down the road is maybe to interview like retired teachers and talk about their story and stuff like that. I think it'll make it that much better, but it does focus a lot on sports and the, you know, the people who have played Valley sports or, you know, sports in general. And, you know, I got to be honest, like the first three shows, I was still getting my feet wet and I was making a lot of mistakes. But I would say, you know, by the fourth show, I had really gotten a rhythm and it's really been enjoyable. And it is, uh, I mean, I've had very limited time on camera, just basically every time we would do one of those live streams out of the Valley Indie office in Ansonia. There's something about like, I don't know how TV people or anybody being in front of a camera is nerve wracking, even when it's a little rinky dink thing that I do at the Valley Indy. Uh, was it like, were you nervous when you were saying you were making mistakes in those first ones? It's got to be kind well, of. Well, yeah. You and, know and, like, I, did you bring out notes or did you, did you do it like the way you do Valley Sports Rewind? You just go in there and have the stuff written uh, in your the, brain. Well, the first couple of shows, I brought out notes because I felt like I needed to because I might forget something. But. The reason I think I would have forgot stuff, and I did, I would have in the first few shows, is because I was nervous. And I'll tell you what I get nervous about, and to this day I still get nervous. I don't ever get nervous when I'm interviewing the guests. I get nervous when I'm starting the show and introducing them. You know, in my head I'm like, am I introducing them right? Am I going to mess up how I say this? And I get nervous when I close the show and I'm giving like my final thoughts about mm -hmm. the interview because... I don't have a teleprompter, so I have to kind of do this all in my head. And you want to make sure you're using the right words when you're introducing them and the right words when, you know, you're closing the show. So that's when I get nervous because in the corner of my eye, I could always see the guest. And mm -hmm. you're just wondering if they're looking at you like, you know, is he doing this right? So that's what I get nervous they about They're going to dump most. water on you all of a sudden? Yeah, you just worry that. Their name. Like, yeah, I mean... I, you know, I think my first guest, I can't, I, I'm i pretty sure it was Bill Pucci, so I had him on and, you know. Of course he, it was Bill Pucci. <laughs> and, um. He's you know, probably he still talking somewhere. <laughs> just kidding, hey, I'm just kidding, Bill. But, um, you know, I think I had him on the first show and, you know, it always helps when you have somebody that's very conversational. The problem you run into is if you ever have a guest that just doesn't say a lot. And I haven't ever run into that problem on the TV side, a little bit on the podcast side, but really the guests do a great job when they're on the show. But, you know, there were some of the mistakes I made. I'll give you a good example. I had had the Hunt family on, and we were paying tribute to Jack Hunt. He was a former football coach at Ansonia High mm -hmm. School, and he unfortunately passed away to cancer in 2012. Um, if I had to do it all over again, I would have had them on much later into the hometown heroes it, because I think they were like my second show. And I think I still wasn't a hundred percent ready when I was doing those shows. Like I was still learning. And if I had to do it all over again, I would have had them later on because then I know exactly how I would have wanted to do the interview and stuff like that. And those are the little things, but you have to learn when you're doing these shows. You know, it's good to make mistakes because then you, you figure out how to correct them as time goes on. And so Bill Pucci was your first guest, uh, if memory right. serves. How many episodes have you done? Well, I mean, if you, if you count them as part one and part two, there's 23. But it, I count, me personally, I always count them as, you know, 
I don't count them as one episode. I count it as two. So 23 plus 23, that's, you know, 46. So we've done 46 episodes. And is there uh, any particular person out there that you've been trying to get, but it just hasn't happened yet? Is there any? Well, yeah, I'm going to tell you right now. And I have made so many calls to different people. I've asked anybody I think that has connections and stuff. Wait, can I guess? We'll make it. We'll make it a, a mystery. Let me see if I can guess it. Is it Brian Dennehy? <laughs> that would be a good one. I never hey, thought of on. him, but I've been trying to get him. I can't. Everyone's like, "Oh yeah, yeah." His cousin's but my mother's sister. My this is a goal, and I don't know if it's ever going to happen. You know, so if anybody is it me? Listening... Is it me, Mike? I'll oh, come on. <laughs> I'm hey, sorry. I'll tell you what. I would never have to talk much because you're good too at doing what you do. But the guy that I really would like to get on is Chris Mad Dog Russo. He used to work at WFAN. Oh, he sure. Does seri- he does serious radio. And the reason I want him is because I want to interview somebody who started off, you know, with nothing and kind of got into the broadcast field and it took him quite a few years to make it big. And I just think he would be the perfect guest because you know why? I always identify him as a guy who I he can relate to the fan. And he would do the show like a fan would do the show. He wouldn't do the show like, you know, something that's scripted or whatever. And I just think he would be the best guest. And I've, I kid you not, I've been trying for about 18 months to get in touch with him somehow, some way. So if anybody's listening and could help me, you'd be doing me a big favor because that is the one goal I have. And maybe I won't reach it. And if I don't, I don't. But that's the goal. And that's the one guest I would like to get on. Yeah, that guy's awesome. He's like the quintessential uh, New Yorker. Did you watch yeah. that that thirty? I think it was a thirty for thirty that ESPN did about him and uh, what was Mike that? Francis. Yeah, I was getting there. I was going to say Russo, but that's yeah, not, yeah, it was it was awesome. It was like touching to watch. Yeah, you know, it just goes to show too that like one thing people could do a lot because they obviously had a lot of arguments on the air and stuff like that, but they were able to kind of put a lot of that aside to keep their show, you know, at the top of the, you know, charts because they really were number one for many years. So even though they may not have liked each other at times, they never really let it affect their show too much. That's a crazy thing about a lot of these radio guys where they're they're partners and they're, you know, among the most popular uh, radio programs uh, in the country. And then it turns out eventually, oh, yeah, they hated each other the whole time and they argued like cats and dogs. Same thing with uh, Opie and Anthony, uh, Howard yeah. Stern and half his crew. You know, uh, I just interviewed Jackie the Joke Man like a week or two ago, former Howard Stern head writer. And it's just amazing to hear, uh, you know, there's a whole different thing going on behind the scenes uh well you know what happens i'm not going to mention this person because i don't want to throw him under the bus but i talked to a guy that has been in radio for years and he had had a partner for about five years they were together for five years they did a morning show and he really did not like him he thought he was pompous he thought he was annoying but you know the old saying like you don't really know what you have till it's gone he told me within 10 months of his because his partner left and like you know went to a different radio station he left connecticut he told me looking back he hated him leaving because he said he never was able to do morning radio as good as he did with that partner so sometimes even though you can't stand each other you know that you have chemistry with each other and when that chemistry is gone it's really hard to duplicate it with somebody else yeah, and how about uh, in terms of looking back over the four years of shows, Hometown Heroes on Comcast Channel 10, is there any particular episode that ranks as your favorite? I know you hate these type of questions. Well, you know what, you're, you're, you're kind of, You're very political. Will, you're going to be on the fence. I understand it, Mike, but I'm going to... No, I try not to be political because... No, I mean me, political in I that, in that, in that yeah. you're, you don't want to offend anybody, I mean. I could tell you this. No, I, I'll answer this in two parts. Number one, there hasn't been a bad guest on Hometown Heroes. They have all been great. And I'm not just saying that. They've all been great. I have not walked out of that studio once and said, God, she wasn't good at all, or he was terrible. Never once. Like, they have all done a great job. But I will tell you the one episode where I got my confidence and I felt like we can continue to do that show. And that's when I had 
Charlie DeCenzo from Derby on. And I'll tell you why I think that one stands out the most. Because that was like my fourth show. I, I Or fifth show. But when I did my fourth one, I really did that one good. But I didn't know the guests that good. I knew about their career, but I didn't know them good. Now, Charlie, I had, he was my principal in high school, and he was also one of my football coaches. And I kid you not, I'm going to be honest with you. When I was going to get him on the show, I had a friend, and I think he's a good friend, but he told me, don't even bother. He's not going to want to come on that show. He's not the type of guy that likes to do interviews. Told me all this. Well, I emailed Charlie, and I said, you know, I'm doing this show. It's like been going on for about six months. Would you be interested? And he replied with, sure, just let me know when and where, and I'll be there. And I kid you not, he got on that show. And he made it so easy for me. He made I was so relaxed because he was answering all the questions like you want somebody when you're when you're interviewing somebody, you want them to kinda, you know, go into detail about each thing. And he did that and I kid you not, I walked out of that studio that day like feeling like a million bucks. I mean, it was just a great episode. And have you had guests on guests? Sorry. I don't know how to speak. I'm a writer. Uh, multiple times? Like, have you had some repeat guests on uh, Hometown Heroes? I haven't, but I will have a repeat coming up. I'm going to do a very special show that's going to focus on the history of Valley football. So I'm going to have Charlie back on the show. I'm also going to have Paul Sponheimer back on the show. He's the longtime Seymour football coach. I had both him and Charlie on separately. They're going to come on, and I'm also going to have with them former Shelton coach Tony Brinka and former Ansonia head coach Bobby Lisi. Bobby's been an assistant with Ansonia for many, many years after he was the head coach, but all four are going to come on. Oh, wow. And we're going to do, yeah, we're going to do a special about, you know, the history of Valley football. So it's going to be nice to bring Charlie and Paul back and it's going to be nice to have Tony and Bobby on as well because Tony's going to represent Shelton Bobby's going to represent Ansonia, Charlie will represent Derby, and Paul will represent Seymour. And I just think that's great for the Valley. I think you should do it like uh, that show, The Sports Writers on whatever channel. Like do it in a dark room with a round table. Have one of them smoking yeah, a cigar. Would, do it old yeah. school like that. That would be awesome. Oh, that sounds I, great. I mean, When are you going to do that? It, that's going to be – I'm going to film it on April 22nd. Oh, wow. It will probably air in July. So – and that's the other thing, too. I've taped so many of these shows in advance. Like the one I aired the other night, I had um, Greg Spock and Ken Chidoba. You, you would think I'm lying to you, but we we filmed that show in December of 2017. And we just aired it the other night because I had done so many shows. I had taped so many that that's when it came time to show that one. But now we're going to be caught up come uh Oh, that's a little nerve-wracking, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is. But... At the same time, it's kind of good, too, because then you could kind of go back and, you know, kind of remember what you were talking about, how to edit it. You know, the editing is the toughest part of anything. The, the interviews are easy. It's always the editing that's the toughest part. Yeah, when you guys do one, so you go over an hour and then you edit it down to one hour? Is that what I, Or am I getting the time wrong? Well, no, wrong? We, we don't ever, like take anything out of the interview unless we feel like somebody fumbled on something or you know like i'll give you a good example dropped one an guest, f-bomb <laughs> well one guest accidentally <laughs> knocked off their microphone during the show so we had to like edit that out but what i mean about editing is we put all sorts of like articles and pictures oh okay from the past and that takes a while to do you would think it's easy you would think like oh just put this picture there and you're all set it, it probably takes a good three or three to five minutes to put one pick in for each like thing you're doing. So say like you used about twelve picks, it takes you about five minutes to do each one. So it's real labor intensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The editing sometimes could take about three hours to do in an hour show. So that's the hardest part, and it's hard too because you want to you got to try to find good photos and good articles that kind of do the guest, you know, justice. You want to make sure that you're making it as good for them as you can. 
Yeah, and that's Sean Morse who's editing all of them, or you guys take turns, or how? And, well, it, and you do no, it at the no, Comcast no. studio up there, or no? Actually, we do it right at Sean's uh, house. Um, okay, gotcha. But Sean handles like all the computer equipment, and he'll, you know, I'll say to him, "Okay, pause. Let's put pick number five in for that part," and that's how we do it. And you know, it, it, you would think, like I said it's very easy to do but it's not like it it does take time and if you want it done right it takes a lot of time and that's why I have to do the shows once a month because otherwise we wouldn't be able to put all these extra things into the interview we'd only be able to really just show the interview because it does take some time to do that stuff yeah right and then Mike switching gears uh, before we wrap up uh, is there anything going on in terms of like uh, Valley sports of note lately? Derby. I mean, I saw somebody. Was it somebody? Uh, Derby basketball. Was it girls basketball or boys basketball? Had a really good year. Fill me in on some yeah, of what I've been missing, um, if you can. I don't mean to. Yeah. Well, you know, the good thing that I'll just give you a good example. I think I'm not sure how Seymour boys did, but I know Derby boys, Shelton boys, and Ansonia boys all made the tournament this year. And the Derby boys basketball team actually made the tournament for the second year in a row. And that's only the second time they've done that in the last, like, 30 years. They went Holy 21 cow. They went twenty one years without making the tournament. So to make the tournament two years in a row back-to-back, that's a great job by, like, Coach Eric O'Toole, the head coach of the team, his staff, and those boys. Because that's not easy to do, and that's a tremendous job by him. And, you know, great job by Ansonia and Shelton as well, making the tournament. Um, I do know Derby and Ansonia were both knocked out the other night in the first round. Ansonia lost to St. Joe's. Um, I think Derby lost to Kaner Tech. I'm pretty sure that's who beat them. But in my opinion, when it comes to basketball, those two schools, Ansonia and Derby, making the tournament to me is a great year for them. And that's what you kind of – that's always got to be the goal every year is just try to make that tournament. And I think if you do that, you had a tremendous season. Yeah, that's great there. Hopefully uh, they're building something there and it will continue. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it's not easy. I mean, you know, I don't want to like people will probably get mad when I say this, but, you know, small schools like Ansonia and Derby, you know, it's you need depth and sometimes you don't have depth. And when you don't have that, it's very hard to be successful in any type of sport. You know, Derby has been very successful with the running program, obviously, but they have a lot of depth, and that's why they're able to be successful. But, you know, sports like basketball and even football these days, it's very hard for Derby to be, you know, competitive when you don't have a lot of players, you know, on your roster. It's not easy. And for, like I said, the basketball team to make the tournament, for a second year in a row. That's just an awesome accomplishment. All right. Hey, look at that. We talked about Luke Perry, 90210, Hometown Heroes, Channel 10 on Comcast once a month. What is the first Tuesday of every month, you said? Yes, first Tuesday of every month. And, I, you know, I do have to, like, you know, applaud you because I remember that. Oh, I don't I need any applause. Show, I, I, I'm barely well, hanging on, Mike. The first show that I remember when I was doing these shows, and we hadn't even really met each other. We talked online and stuff. You would promote the show for me on the Sentinel, and, and, and I never forgot that that was very good that you did that. And because a lot of people go to the Valley Independent Sentinel, I'll, you know, I know a guy who lives in he lives in Washington now, and he'll send me a message every now and then saying, you know, I heard the interview with Jim Del Volpe the other day, or I heard the interview with this, great job. So, I mean, people do follow that website, and I, I think that website played a big part in, you know, getting people to listen to my show and watch it, so I do appreciate that. Uh, no problem. I should do it again. What we should do is get you set up with, like, a username and password so you can, when the show's coming on, you can put up an image or something like that and remind people because... I mean, half the thing with, like, uh, uh, announcements like that and press releases and stuff like that, a lot of times I just can't get to it anymore because it's just like, you know, my, my I'm looking at my Gmail right now. I have 8,278 messages. <laughs> oh, God bless you, man. <laughs> so, like, things just <laughs> fall through the cracks. So I got to figure out a better way 
to do that. And just as a final note, anybody out there, when you're sending in press releases, do not send PDFs. PDFs are the work of the devil. Put it as a plain text email with a separate JPEG. No PDFs. Just say no to PDFs. It's 2019. No more PDFs. All right, there. I ended. I, on, I ended on a bitter note. How's that for a Valley Sports Rewind? <laughs> what do you say hey, to that, Poochie? Lot. Poochie thinks I talk too much. <laughs> uh, believe me, he he, he uh, would definitely come on if you asked him to. I promise you that. <laughs> I'm just kidding, by the way. I'm trying to. We got to create some kind of a podcast war. That's what this podcast needs. You know, like oh, some yeah, kind of hey. rival. Uh, I don't know. I'm just thinking of anything. Uh, All right. You know, it's never. It's always good to you know keep thinking about different things. It can't be a bad thing. All right, Mister Mike. That is it. You want to uh, uh, play us out, and then I'll hang up on you. Yeah, you know, I just want to kind of close it with, uh, you know, we talked about Luke Perry, and I really just do want to say that, like, you know, I've you obviously see a lot of celebrities die and you don't really know them. And, you know, even though I met him once, I didn't know him and I don't pretend to, but he was a part of my childhood and I was as big a fan of his character as anybody. And I really am like, this one has really hit me harder than most. And, you know, my heart goes out to his family and, you know, he had two children and it's just sad. It's the life isn't fair. 52 years old is just too young for somebody to go that quick and who had all that potential. So, you know, prayers and thoughts go out to his family. Well said, Mike. All right, do, do your closing uh, Valley Sports Rewind thing. Oh, okay. And that was uh, Eugene Drisco. <laughs> yeah, it was. And, yeah, and he did a great job. I really appreciate it. And, guys, I promise you we're going to continue to do this show. It's a great show. I really enjoy doing it every time we do it. And... Just keep listening because we're going to keep being here. I'm Mike Kenichi for Valley Sports Rewind saying good night, everyone. Hey, wait, I want to talk about my sports career. 1992, I. <laughs> <laughs> I <thought the> <laughs>